I'm attorney Michael Tyler, bringing you guests and information to help you get legal. Hello, and welcome back to another installment of Get Legal. I'm your host, attorney Michael Tyler. We have some great subject matter lined up for you today, but before I get into that, I just want to go over something that I guess has been uh, vexing some of the cases that I work on in my practice, and that is the utilization of social media by clients. For some, social media seems like a harmless tool that allows you to communicate with others, share information, photographs, videos, and the like. However, when it comes to injury cases, social media can definitely be a bugaboo. For example, if you say you're injured and you say that you have severe back injury, then you should never have posted on your social media during the pendency of your claim or litigation case videos of you jumping or diving off into a swimming pool. That never works well when me as your attorney or any other attorney goes to try to resolve or settle your case. Please be cognizant that just because your name is attached to or placed upon a web page or a social media page does not mean that you have 100% ownership of that page. The page is still owned by the company that maintains and hosts that social media page. So therefore, even if you have it set up to where certain individuals are only privy to the information that you post, you still do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to your social media page or account. Defense attorneys, if your case goes into litigation, will ask you for a listing of all of your social media accounts as well as, in some instances, a request that you download the entirety of your social media pages. This is discoverable material, and for as much as an attorney might want to limit access to that, they more than likely will get access to it. So please, number one, if you're involved in a motor vehicle accident, please try to refrain from posting pictures or images of your vehicle after the accident. Please try not to go live while you're at the accident scene trying to get it processed with the law enforcement agent. Reason being is humanistically, you might make a statement after being questioned by those who follow you, you might make a statement of everyone is fine, no one is injured, everyone's okay. Once that gets out, it's kind of hard for us as an attorney to put that back in the barn, so to speak because now you've made a declaration close to the time of the incident that the defense can rely on. So please, number one, don't post anything after your accident. Number two, only share information with your attorney, your medical providers. If you're married or engaged, you will share it with your spouse or your fiance. That is fine. Just please ask the spouse or the fiance to not share that on social media. Your doctor has an ethical duty to not disclose your information so that he shouldn't or she shouldn't post it on social media. The same with your attorney. We're bound by our ethical duty to not share clients' information. Although some of this might sound very mundane and simple, social media has become so pervasive these days that people are almost tied to it on a daily basis. They have to go to sleep, only after posting or reading social media. They have to wake up reading social media and through the day they have to post something on social media for whatever purpose that they have to post it. But this is the reality that we live in. And understanding the realities that we live in should help you to properly govern yourself as you matriculate and go further through this here society that we're currently living in. But please understand that social media posts, recordings, images and videos have recently started to cause detrimental, very, very bad effects upon cases these days. Please understand that and govern yourself accordingly. So other than that, today I have a wonderful guest for you guys today. We're gonna to be talking some civil law issues, i.e. family law, as well as some succession matters. And today joining me will be the great attorney Ethel Clay here in Baton Rouge. Welcome Ethel. 
you for having me. Well, uh, you're located here in Baton Rouge, correct? Yes. All right, and you're an attorney. How long have you been practicing? 11 years. Okay, and with your 11-year practice, what would you say your primary uh, areas of practice are? Primarily, I practice in the areas of family law. I um, handle successions, and I also do some criminal as well. Okay. Now, I don't do any more family law. I used to do it, but uh, I can tell you right now, it, it causes uh, an attorney to spend a lot of time on a case. Right. Uh, and you do get a lot of phone calls from your clients uh, for various reasons, all the way down to uh, the spouse or ex-spouse has come by and picked up the dog and you need something done about it. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, you deal with uh, all that. So with that, what caused you to get into family law? Um, family law was something I was interested in in law school and I had a great professor in law school and we discussed a lot about family law, but um, family law is also interesting because it affects everybody. That is true. Yes, it affects a lot of people. It goes from divorces to custody to child support, spouse support, property. It, it affects everybody. That is true. That is uh, very much so true. And with that, I would assume that you get a lot of calls. I absolutely do. Okay. All the time. So with that, um, you mentioned something before about divorces. So let's say we have a married couple out there watching or one of the partners in a, a marital union is watching and the marital union is starting to crumble and fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any tips that you would provide to a person who is contemplating divorce uh, so that when they get ready to possibly file, uh, they'll know some of the things that they need to have in a row so that the process can go somewhat smoothly? Um, well, I think it all depends on um, if there are children in the home, if there is a differential in what one spouse makes over the other, um, and you just have to prepare yourself financially because you're suddenly going from sharing expenses in your income to being by yourself. And you also have to think about how you're going to care for the children independently and things like that. And so um, the spouse that makes more money divorce probably will spend more money and they will have to probably pay child support or spousal support depending on the differential in the um, incomes and so I think that if it's an amicable separation that it's very much things that you can work out. Family law is all about mediation and cooperating and and things of that nature but the courts are in place for people who can't work it out. And so um, my advice would be that you just talk to your spouse beforehand and ha tailor your expectations so each other will know what to expect once you all are separated. Sounds simple, but yeah, sometimes not N so much. Nothing in what we do is simple. Right. <laughs> For as much as people think it is, nothing is simple. With that being the case, uh, let's say client uh, comes to you and is contemplating a divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're gonna keep it simple here. We're okay. not even gonna get into covenant marriages. Okay. We'll, let's leave right. that out. Okay. Let's just deal with uh, regular marriages here in the state of Louisiana. Uh, if a person comes to you and they need advice on possibly terminating the marital union, mm -hmm. uh, are there particular forms of divorce, yes. types of divorce yes. uh, that can be talked about? Yes. Um, firstly, I would ask if they have minor children, children that are under the age of 18. Um, that is a determining factor because it depends on how long you have to stay separate and apart before you can get divorced. If you have minor children under the age of 18, then you have to wait 365 days. If there are no minor children, then you only have to wait 180 days. Um, that's what's called a 102 divorce. You file for divorce, you wait the period of time based on your situation, and then you finalize your divorce. We also have a 103 divorce. A 103 divorce is where the parties live separate and apart for the requisite amount of time prior to filing for the divorce. And the divorce happens somewhat quicker, maybe within three weeks to a month. And with that, uh, be it a 102 or a 103 divorce, uh, for a person to seek a divorce, does there have to be some element of fault on behalf of one of the married partners 
or can it be what we call no fault? Okay, the 102 and 103 divorces are what we have in Louisiana as no fault divorces. You are absolutely able to get a divorce based on adultery and you're absolutely able to get a divorce based on the criminal convictions, uh, some criminal convictions. Um, those require testimony. They require you to actually be able to prove those and a lot of times people don't have the requisite amount of evidence to prove, let's say, a divorce for adultery because it's, it's, it's the burden is high to prove um, an adultery divorce. So a lot of times people just go for the no-fault divorce. You don't have to allege anything on behalf of the party as the reason why you all are divorcing. Just the period of time. And with that being the case, are there instances where the parties won't have to appear in court in order to get the divorce or would it be a, a requirement that the parties have to appear in court? No, we have what's called default divorces. Once you file for the divorce, you would serve the other person and if the other person agrees to the divorce or doesn't answer, then we have methods in Louisiana to where neither of the parties ever have to see each other. We go to the judge, present our evidence as the attorney and the judge grants the divorce. Now, do you also have to resolve your community property issues before the divorce is resolved, or can you do that after? Um, you absolutely have to do it after. You cannot separate community property until after you are divorced. Um, again, community property is about cooperating and discussing and mediating. And so once you, your divorce is finalized, then you can partition petition the court to partition your community property. In some cases, you can ask the court um, to end the marital regime while your divorce is pending and begin your community property at that time as well. And so, but you have to file for a divorce prior to partitioning the community property. Okay, well, we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, we're gonna talk about uh, spousal support issues as well as child custody issues. So please, come back and join us. Welcome back. Once again, we're joined by attorney Ethel Clay. Hey, Ethel. Uh, we were recently talking about uh, aspects of divorce. Yes. Uh, and one aspect of divorce that uh, usually has to be dealt with is child custody. Uh, if you can, just impart some wisdom to us as to what is usually done when it comes to child custody matters. Usually, um, what a lot of people don't know is that equal shared custody is favored under the law. So. Fathers have just as much right to the children as mothers. And um, if the parties were married and the father lived in the home with the children, then he is more than capable, the courts see, think that he's more than capable of being responsible independently with um, his children. And so, you know, fathers no longer have to be scared or think that the mother's automatically the person who will um, obtain custody of the kids if the parents are able to take the children to school and help them with their homework and feed them and have a comfortable place for them to live, most of the times the judges will order equal shared custody, at least in East Baton Rouge Parish. In some of the outlying parishes it may be different, but in East Baton Rouge Parish, um, equal shared custody is very much favored. Okay. And even with that, when it comes to child custody, that of course begs the question or the issue of child support. Yes. Uh, and I believe uh, Louisiana has attempted to simplify the child support issue. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't dabble in this aspect of law anymore, but if you can impart to the people here, uh, what should they look towards or look at or look forward to dealing with when it comes to child support? Child support is the easiest, easiest aspect of family law because it's all about the numbers. Um, the courts look at how much income the mother makes, how much income the fathers make. They plug it into a, um, a worksheet that our um, that the the representatives and and senators have come up with, and 
whatever number comes out, that's your child support amount. It's no magic number, it's no magic figure. Um, you bring your check stubs and it's easy. They have child support guidelines that tell us if you have, if, if the parties make this much together and they have two children, this is how much their child support is supposed to be. And so it's, it's, it's really simple. It's nothing really to fight or argue about. But again, you can always agree on the child support amount. And with that, I believe uh, years back, and I think even here today, we have some people who think that they're smarter than the system. Yeah. Uh, and being smarter than the system, once they get served with that child support paperwork, they decide to go and quit their job. Yes. Uh, what do you say to that? That, that is a uh, no-no. Um, because we have in Louisiana what's called underemployed. And so we will look at what you normally, the job that you normally have and the income that that job normally makes, and that will be used to calculate your child support. You won't get the benefit of not working unless you have a disability that prevents you from working, and that would have to be proved. So it would not be beneficial at all to quit your job because you will still be held to the same standard as if you were working. So keep your job. Gotcha. Now let's say we have an instance where, uh, let's say you were representing the father mm -hmm. uh, in the divorce and the custody or divorce and or custody case. Uh, and let's say uh, the father was hit with a child support obligation. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say father comes to you and says, you know, attorney Ethel, I decided for the past three months that I'm not paying my child support obligation. Are there any type of detrimental effects? Can anything bad happen to father for not paying his child support obligation? Yes. Every, it can. Father can go to jail for failure to pay his child support obligation. We have in Louisiana what's called a contempt. And um, contempt is failing to abide by a court order. And once you have an obligation of child support and it's, um, it's in a judgment form, then that is something that you have to follow. When you don't follow that for any reason, especially for child support, the opposing party can bring you back to court and ask the judge to hold you in your contempt for failure to pay. Now, going to jail is not automatic. Um, you will have the opportunity to pay. And if you don't pay, once the judge gives you that opportunity, then of course, the ramification will be that you are imprisoned. And with that, uh, I know here in East Baton Rouge Parish, we have some wonderful family law judges. We do. Uh, family court judges, shall mm -hmm. I say. Uh, and with that, although they don't dabble in the criminal aspect of things, they do have the power to in prison right. an individual. Absolutely. What would you say to the individual who might feel when they come to family court that because the judge is not a criminal judge per se, what would you say to them if they say, well, I'm not too worried about the judge putting me in jail because, well, they probably won't do it since they're not a criminal judge? Um, their jurisdiction is criminal jurisdiction. However, the civil law, in all aspects of civil law, we have contempts, whether you're talking about civil judgments or you're talking about family judgments. And when you um, embark upon contempts, those are criminal in nature. And so because the law affords a remedy for a person's failure to abide by judgment, then the contempt is the remedy that a family court judge does have the ability to enforce. And therefore, they can put you in jail. And I will tell you that one of the weirdest things, um, I was handling a criminal case one time, okay. uh, and then I went up to the fourth floor here in Baton Rouge uh, to talk to a few people that I knew. And, and it just struck me as very, very weird because I was sitting in the criminal uh, courtroom and nobody went to jail. Okay. <laughs> but when I went to the family courtroom, people went to jail. And I just found that to be very, very odd because my expectation was the opposite. Right. So I will tell you people that those judges, they will put you in court because they want you to live up to your obligations. And that's all it is. It's not to uh, punish you from any type of personal uh, aspects or standpoints. It's just to make sure that you live up to your obligations. So please be mindful that if they are potentially subjecting you to jail in family court, 
more than likely you probably will receive that sentence. So do what you need to do, adhere to your obligations. Now, transitioning a little bit, uh, we've talked about custody, we've talked about child support. Uh, I know for a little while when I worked at the Attorney General's office, we did this thing uh, called constituent services every now and then where attorneys uh, periodically had to answer calls from the public. And a few times I got calls from grandparents who were stating that uh, the other side, either the mother of the child or the father of the child that their son or daughter is married to, uh, is keeping them from seeing the child or the grandchildren. Are there any type of remedies out there for grandparents who want to see their grandchildren? Yes, we, the law affords um, grandparents to have visitation. A lot of times this comes into play because of one of their children have died and they want to still be a part of their grandparent, their grandchildren's lives. And so um, they petition the court just like a parent would and ask the court to grant them visitation. Now, a lot of times grandparents have to understand that this visitation will not amount to the same type of visitation a parent will have and they must keep that in mind. Um, maybe one weekend every six weeks or every two months. Um, they may get holiday visitation, however that holiday visitation will not actually be on the actual holiday, but they have every right to petition the court, ask the court to be able to visit with their grandchildren, but it's always best to try to get along with the other parent because the other parent and cooperating with them will get you much more time with your grandkids than not. Now another thing I want to ask you, uh, it's come up quite a bit is the issue of spousal support in a divorce. Uh, again, I try to refrain from doing all aspects of family law. So if you can impart, uh, what exactly would you look at from the standpoint of trying to pursue spousal support? Okay, so um, first, a lot of people, when they call me, they ask for alimony. In Louisiana, it is called spousal support, but it's the exact same thing. Um, we have two different types of spouse support, interim and final. Interim spouse support is the spouse support that a spouse can get while the divorce is pending. Final spouse support is what a person can get after the divorce is finalized. Um, the standards are very different based on your situation, but at the end of the day, it's contingent upon the person who's requesting it need and the other person who will be paying their ability to pay. So the person, if they can show that they have income that exceeds their expenses, then they have the ability to pay. The person who's requesting it has to show that they have expenses that exceed their income, which will show a need. And um, that's basically the crux of spouse support, of course, the burden is higher for final spousal support, um, but it's a lot to get into right now. All right. No, I can imagine. Uh, but if anyone has questions about it, are they free to call you? Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. I, we've plastered your number on the screen here. There we go. So uh, if anyone has questions about spousal support, please feel free to contact uh, attorney Ethel Clay. Uh, before we get out of here, just real quick, you do successions. Yes. Just impart a little bit of information to the people. Okay, well, a lot of people, um, don't have wills and you're not required to have a will to um, have a succession done when you don't have a will of course the law has a way to say how your property and where your property will go um, once you die of course it's always great to have a will because your wishes will be carried out in the will but make sure that if you do have a will that you keep it in a very very safe space and that people who are named in the will know where it is because you have to have an original copy of the will. If you don't have an original copy, then it's other things that you have to go through to um, enforce your will. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ethel. I hope you guys took this information to heart. If you have any questions, please contact Attorney Clay. I am your host, Attorney Michael Tyler. Let's get legal. See you next time.